Welcome to Shooting Straight with A1F.com. I'm Frank Miniter, the Editor-in-Chief of America's First Freedom. Today we're talking with Stephen Hunter. When he worked at the Washington Post, Steve won a Pulitzer for movie criticism. If you don't know his Bob Lee Swagger thrillers, you're in for a treat. Swagger's adventures begin with Point of Impact, a book that became the movie Shooter starring Mark Wahlberg. Steve's latest book is Basil's War. The hero of this splendid read is a British agent who goes behind enemy lines during World War II. Steve, let's start here. It's an entirely new hero for you. What got you started on Basil? I think the voice. Uh, like any Midwestern cluck, I've been enchanted through British movie accents over the years. And as you indicate, I've seen way too many movies for anybody's good. And I love the way the Brits talk. I love all their uh, idiosyncrasies, their eccentricities. I love their, uh, I love it when they say, they throw the word then around for some reason. Oh, we'll go to the store then. Or, um, hello, let's go shooting then. Or, and just little things like that you pick up. And I don't know why I find that so enchanting, but I do. And I seem to write quite easily in that voice. And this book is an exercise in that voice. It's written as if I went to Balliol College at Oxford and, am, uh, and you know, served in the Special Operations Executive in World War II. And uh, it was just a lot of fun to do it like that, as opposed to a more omniscient, objective third person um, a narrator. And uh, I had fun pretending that I was Claude Rains uh, as the narrator. It was just, you know, and I think you'll like it better if you imagine, you don't hear my cranky Chicago accent, but you imagine arriving to you in the voice of Claude Rains <laughs> or George Sanders or any of those wonderfully polished British actors who just totally lightened up American movies for years and years and years. Well, it reminded me of some earlier British literature, like Evelyn Waugh and that school of writing from the early 20th century. Um, fun, derisive, uh, following a hero with an old school kind of set of beliefs he would have in, in World War II, um, but not a modern hero. I, I'm just wondering what made you go to that kind of guy. I understand you love the British voice, but what intrigued you about that character? I, I found him just delightful. I think it was the contrast between superciliousness and capability. The guy is extraordinarily capable. I mean, he's not James Bond. He's not a Superman. And I make sure to get him beat up pretty badly over the course of this novel. But he's just a he's a natural secret agent. But for a variety of uh, psychological reasons, he plays. He's sort of like the Scarlet Pimpernel in that he plays – a rather silly, snobby, British upper class twit pretending to have nothing to do with uh, with the war. And uh, that's a masquerade to keep the, the, the public and uh, his friends from understanding where he really disappears to for weeks on end. And of course, that's occupied France. The year is 1943. And... Uh, there are some issues involving secret decoding machines and the like. And um, uh, it's, there's a cat and mouse game. I, you know, I think gun people might be a little disappointed in that there's only two shots fired in the entire book. And uh, there's no elaborate action sequences. It's more about... It, it's more about... Uh, Cat and Mouse about detective and 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 uh, uh, man on the run. Uh, he has to get into occupied Paris. He has to get out. The net is tightening. We cut between him and his pursuers, and his pursuers have issues too. One is an abwar intelligence officer, and the other is a rather stupid SS major. And I think we get a view of. Uh, the complexities of the German war effort and the folly of the German war effort and those two people. But it was most of all, I would call it an entertainment. Graham Greene used to make a distinction between his serious novels and 
novels he wrote for fun, uh, which he called entertainments. Now, I hope people have fun reading this book. I have to say, I had enormous fun writing it. And uh, so if it's not an entertainment for them, it's certainly been an entertainment for me. Well, given the absolute seriousness of these times, I, I just found it to be a wonderful diversion uh, away from the politics of, of the moment with what the Biden administration is about to do to our freedom and so on. Thank you so much, Frank. And that's that's really what really what I'm selling here. I'm a travel agent, not a novelist. I'm selling a vacation. And if you buy into this book, you get to go on a secret mission in 1943 in occupied France with an insouciant, rather witty and ironic and seemingly blasé British agent who is secretly as hard as steel and as smart as Sherlock Holmes. And you get to watch him in operation and you get to watch his opponents in operation. And I hope to give you a vacation for, as you know, it's not a long book. It's not really miserable or anything. Uh, you hope, I, I hope to give you, you know, a trip to Steve land, to Steve world, a uh, world war two sub village for four to six hours. And I, I think folks will enjoy it. I, I, I really do. Oh, I did. It made me think of Heller's Catch-22, actually. I, I found it funny and amusing and fast. Um, now, this is, a, this is a big juxtaposition, a big change from your Bob Lee Swagger thrillers, um, which you were writing when you were, you, were beginning, well, you began writing, I think wrote most of them, wrote most of them when you were at the Washington Post. And it, it always amuses me or just intrigues me what that must have been like. You writing movie criticism for the Washington Post, which has become a very anti-gun newspaper. Um, and you're a gun guy, and you're getting to know the gun world. Um, you're, you're writing that character who's a complete gun guy. What did people think of you there? How, how did you coexist in that environment? I have to say, everyone at the Post was always decent to me. Uh, there was never any issue of, you know, this was before the age of blackballing and doxing and all the kind of dirty things that people do to ideological opponents then. And the newsroom was a tolerant democracy. And I never had any trouble. I think, you know, when I think back on it, uh, I thought of myself as an ambassador from Gun World. And I wanted to prove to them that someone who knew the difference between a 30 6 and a 308 could also write a hell of a good movie review, be an amusing uh, colleague, and speak the language of of journalism, which is, I would call, neurotic irony. Uh, you know, we were all gaping and teasing and needling each other in fraudulent personalities, but having a great deal of time in doing it. No one was ever mean to me. I was never denied anything. Uh, I was never uh, censored. I was never discouraged. Uh, I, perhaps they thought of me as their crazy uncle. I, you know, that was the deal I made. And for my part, I tried to be good, uh, well-behaved. I tried not to, um, uh, you know, I would never bearded or, or got in arguments with people. I tried not to be a heavy, oppressive presence, a problem in the newsroom. And uh, I also tried to use my talent uh, for the post in writing about things that they were when they just didn't have the minds on staff to do. And I did a number of firearms pieces for them that I'm very proud of. One when Winchester decided to uh, end the production, the domestic production of the Model 94. Another when the NRA Museum uh, did a special exhibit on uh, the Thompson submachine gun. Still a third when the great uh, Marine sniper, uh, Carlos Hathcock, died. And all those pieces were very well received, not only by the staff, but also by the readers of the Post. And I was able to illuminate parts of the universe that had been been uh, off limits, not off limits, but that they didn't even know existed. And, and that I felt, uh, you know, that made me proud. I, I was I was very uh, pleased to have been able to, to do that and to be given an opportunity, a platform to do it. As, as I recall, you left there in 2008, correct? 
uh, was it eight? I think it was eight, yeah. Right. And I left at exactly the right moment. Uh, the uh, Obama election had not yet taken place. The coverage had not really geared up. I, I left in early September of 08. Um, you know, I think with Obama and then with Bush, I'm sorry, with, with Trump, American journalism crossed a Rubicon and went in a direction that would have made me uncomfortable. Well, I think you'd be canceled today, Steve. Literally, I think it would just cancel you. Yeah. And that, you know, so I wasn't there for that. And so I'm like the guy who, you know, I was the last guy off the Titanic uh, at Liverpool. And to me, he asked me, how was the Titanic? I go, oh, it's a beautiful ship. You know, it's a wonderful ship. The deck chairs are beautifully arranged, you know, and I have no bad memories or anger uh, in the post uh, settled a very generous retirement on me. And I have this thing about the patron. They're still my patron. And if you're receiving patronage, uh, you should not, you will not, and simply not done to criticize one's behavior, uh, one's patrons, uh, if you're accept if you're cashing the check. So you'll never hear a negative about the Washington Post from me. Right, but did you did you see any of this coming? I mean, you saw the deck chairs, a lack of lifeboats on the deck, or you know, the work that metaphor. Um, did, did you see this? You knew these people. Did you see it going this direction? That's a really good question. And the answer, I, to be honest about it, is no. Uh, I believe I left before Obama was nominated or maybe just in the direction. And what I did not encounter was the degree to which they would fall in absolute, total, desperate love with him. And... I, you know, I just, uh, I'm glad I didn't see that. I could see it from the outside. I'm glad I didn't see it from the inside. And that, I don't think they've ever come back from that direction. And I, I just, uh, I felt, uh, it, and I did not see signs, perhaps because I was blind to them. You know, perhaps because I was, you know, I'm a narcissist, as most writers are. I mostly look inside myself, and I was paying more attention to what was on my screen as opposed to, that is, my work, as opposed to what people were saying to me. And um, so I escaped. Um, escape isn't quite uh, the right word. I, I chose to get off the big ship at a moment in history when everything, there were no tremors of self-destruction uh, evident to me in my, uh, in my little uh, cubicle on the fifth floor uh, where my main worry was how heavy would the traffic be uh, to get to the screening of uh, a meat train Midnight Meat Train, which was the last movie I reviewed for the Washington Post. <laughs> what a way to go out. And, um, you know, it was it was a job that demanded a lot of attention to little details. And I hate little details. So I was always scrambling to keep up with stuff I'd forgotten, um, trying to get to places where I had to get, and uh, worried about traffic. You know, people ask, what is film criticism about? Well, at the newspaper level, what it's mainly about is getting places through traffic at a certain time. Because the screenings are in usually suburban uh, theaters. Uh, you usually go, have to go through rush hour. And I just can't tell you how much of that job was spent cur cursing traffic jams on Wisconsin Avenue out to Chevy Chase. You know, that was, when I think of that, I think of myself, you know, nervous and anxious and uh, my ulcer on fire because I missed a stoplight at Wisconsin and 38th Street, you know, that sort of thing. And um, so, so I don't, because of that, sort of self-inflicted craziness, I wasn't aware of what was going on in the larger sense. Especially given all the new gun owners, what, 8 million last year, and many richer Democrats, that has to 
affect the, the politics of this at some point. That is going to be very interesting to see how that plays out. Um, uh, there are millions of new gun owners, and what percentage of, of them will, will... I mean, there will be a certain percentage that will still fear the guns. They'll load it and lock, a, lock it away, and they'll think about it way too often and way too neurotically, and they'll be frightened of it, and they'll never learn it. They won't go and practice with it, and they'll ultimately hurt someone with it. Or will they be uh, convinced by its tool-like uh, reality and understand that like a hammer and a drill and a uh, lathe, it just has to be practiced with and used uh, to get out of it what is there. And, and you will learn through that to make friends with it and you will learn that it, in you know, 99.9 percent of the American cases, it's not all that dramatic. This is a piece of greasy steel, and uh, you know, um, and when you sort of make that breakthrough, then you're viable to understanding its history, its culture, its meaning, its complexity, its aesthetics, and all the all the pleasures of gun, pl of gun culture that seem so obvious to us, but are just mysterious and uh, in, uh, assaultive to people who, who, haven't, who, who don't feel it and who, who won't open their minds to look at it. Well, it's empowering, it's fun, going to the range is just a good time. Uh, what are you shooting lately? What are you up to? Uh, well, the new book I'm writing, I'm happy to report, is set in World War II, which was a war without cell phones or satellites, or uh, and it had really cool uniforms, tanks, cars, clothes, and hats, and guns. And so for the eccentricity of the book, I've been buying a lot of pre-war Mauser Sporters, and they are fabulously made rifles in very interesting uh, uh, calibers, and I've just recently discovered, and I'm going to incorporate it in the book, a wonderful rifle, a Holland and Holland uh, 240 Apex. Now, there's an obscure one for you. It's a, essentially a pre-243 win, but it was made uh, for about 30 years by Holland and Holland as a planes game gun for the African hunter. And it's just one of the most beautiful, you know, I mean, all the, uh, the Holland and Holland Mausers, and most of the pre-war Mauser sporters are beautiful rifles. And see, a part of me just loves the beauty of the things. I mean, they are to me, uh, an object laden with aesthetic significance, and I, and I, I, in my imagination, stirred. And someone whom I, one of the characters whom I love very much, is going to find himself, I hope, in a naturally believable sequence in which. And the other thing about those rifles is so cool is that they were, as the Brits call them, they were take apart rifles, which means they could be unscrewed into two parts, which means they could be carried in a GI rucksack, which means that under certain circumstances, if necessary, uh, a Steve Hunter character could take off his rucksack and screw together the, and put together the take-apart rifle because it was the appropriate rifle to face an opponent who was facing him across a mile of Norman Bocage, which is very tight, twisty, terrific sniper territory. And that's so that's what this book builds to. And I just have had the time of my life writing about it. I just uh, every night is I mean, it's the highlight of my day that in my wife's coffee. And uh, I, what else what does any man need in an occasional trip to the village? Do you have optics on these rifles? Are you finding classic optics as well, or no? The rifle I'm getting, it's actually, I can't, a, a real 243, I'm sorry, a real 240 Apex, the cheapest one I could find was 
$12,000. And even though I'm a multi-billionaire, I couldn't afford that. And uh, so what I have bought is an Oberndorf Mauser customized as a 243 because uh, ballistically the 243 and the 240 Apex are about um, are about uh, you know are twins you know separated at birth and uh, so this you know I like to shoot the rifles that I write about to the degree or the weapons uh, the firearms that I write about to the degree that I can and this was the fastest way to that sensation uh, and this one is it's a model it's a small ring uh, Mauser that a custom Smith converted to 243 and put in a beautiful English scope a uh, stock and happily it has a loophole stock a uh, sight on it so I won't be struggling with a dialectic you know 2.5 or some obscure you know the, the German scopes were so complicated I couldn't begin to understand how they operate but I think I'll be okay at a loophole in a 243 and I'll uh, I'll be able to describe what happens pretty well. Well, that you get into the guns that are, you write about really shows in your writing, brings them right to life. Um, where can people find you? Oh, well, this book is actually not finished and it won't be out for quite some time. Uh, the first book, uh, the book, of course, uh, Basil's War will be out very shortly in early May. Uh, and then sometime next year along comes, and the name of the book, I'm very proud of it. I think you'll like it. People seem to like it. The Bullet Garden. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, it's a uh -huh. description of the Bocage, which is this beautiful part of Normandy, which the Germans understood was sniper territory. And they infiltrated uh, many, many snipers into that territory. And the snipers were terrible havoc on the American troops. And uh, it was a real crisis. I mean, we were stuck in the Bocage for about six weeks, taking very heavy casualties. And my book is looks at that and finds a technical, finds a way to to un to defuse that situation, at least from a uh, a morale point of view. Uh, and as I say, writing it is fun. <laughs> I can't wait to read that. So do you have a website? Where else can people find you? Well, you can find me on Facebook on Steve Hunter. Uh, when the book is published, Simon & Schuster will put up a nice website or expand a website. Uh, I, um, Steve Hunter at Facebook is sort of the best way to keep up with me, although... I'm sort of a, a sluggish uh, poster, uh, you know. I don't. I'm not one of those presences on the on the web. I, you know, mainly use it to show off pictures of my beautiful grandchildren and crack mild little jokes at my own expense and throw in some uh, throw in some pictures of my grandkids or some professional news uh, sooner or later, you know, every once in a while. Uh, but that's that's mainly where I am. And of course, I am in your local bookstore. They'll find you someday, Steve. <laughs> well, thanks for coming on. Yeah, it's my pleasure. It's really been fun, Frank.